everyone. Um, my name is Abby. I work at the Trust as part of the um, STO uh, Sun Trust Online team. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be your host for today. Um, this is the first in a series of webinars we're going to be holding over the next year or so, um, all to better support um, our students on uh, our students of colour um, and students who want to work on their mental well-being. Um, we've worked with a fantastic group of alumni um, and partners and experts to shape um, a really exciting um, slate of uh, webinars, so please um, do keep an eye out for those. Um, and these roles kind of help you um, uh, help to make sure that we're catering to all our students who are preparing to go to university or the workplace or um, wherever you uh, end up in your journey. Um, and of course, these sessions are all to supplement um, kind of the new resources and units we launched on the platform just last week. Um, hopefully you've seen them. Um, if, uh, oh, sorry, can everyone hear me? I've seen on the chat a few people. Can anyone uh, just unmute themselves or pop in chat if they can't? Okay, great, I'm seeing yes, great. Um, yep, so as I was saying, we've um, recently launched a few um, new units to support um, students of color and students who um, are interested in uh, working on their mental wellbeing. And those are on your homepage on Centrust Online. Um, and this webinar is to supplement those. So please do check them out if you haven't already. Um, so today's panel, we're going to be talking about journeys to higher education and beyond. We have a really uh, inspiring group of um, people from all different industries. Uh, we've got um, media, education, advertising and academia, um, all really interesting um, people with really unique journeys. Um, and that's something we really want to highlight today that um, it's your journey is really your own. It's probably not going to look like anything uh, you expected uh, when you were growing up. Um, and that's completely fine. Um, and hopefully hearing from all of these panelists today will give you um, some insight into some of the possibilities that are out there. Um, today's session is um, specifically to shed light on the experiences of people of colour. Um, so we're gonna be having some candid conversations today. Some topics might be uncomfortable, every single one of them will be extremely important. So just a reminder that we are here as a community to listen, um, start conversations, um, and then we remember to respect everyone's opinions and views. Um, the panelists today are here to share their story, um, their knowledge and their wisdom. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that no culture is a monolith. So you may um, you may or may not have similar experiences to um, the, the ones you hear today. Um, and if you don't um, you know, feel like uh, you're necessarily represented on the panel today, that feels completely fine, but just a reminder, we do have an entire community of alumni on STO chat um, who are extremely friendly and waiting to hear from you as well. So feel free to um, uh, reach out to them um, after this session. Um, all that said, please don't be shy about asking questions. Um, some of you will have submitted some beforehand, so we'll get started with those um, when we do start. But then we'll open up the floor later on. Um, so as the session goes, please do remember to submit um, your questions using the Q&A function. That's just at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop. Um, you can also use the chat function to um, share any uh, thoughts or comments you have as we go, um, go along. Um, and finally, just let you know, the session is going to be recorded. Um, and uh, so if you do have to drop off at any point um, or, or your connection drops or anything, um, all of this will be available to you um, after the fact. So don't worry about that. Um, and I think I saw some questions about how long this session is going to be. We're going to be going um, up until around 5.30, um, depending on how many questions we have. I think we've got quite a few people with us today, so um, we might run out and run over by maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But of course, please do feel free to um, hop off at 5.30 if you need to. Um, so I think that is all the housekeeping from me. So let's get into it. Um, I'll start really quickly by introducing my um, introducing myself, um, though it's um, you probably don't want to hear much from me. Um, my name is Abby. As I said, um, I work at the Trust as the Digital Programs Officer. I've been with the Trust um, about two years now. Um, I'm originally from um, Jamaica. Spent half my life in Wales um, and went to university at New York University Abu Dhabi, and I studied political science there. Um, and have been based in London, working with the Trust um, since. Um, and again, really grateful to our panelists for giving up their time today and really excited to hear from them. Uh, and without further ado, I will hand over to them to give a really quick introdu introduction before we get into um, some of the questions that we got. Um, so why don't we start with uh, Jan, who's first on my screen. 
Hi everyone, um, my name is Jan and I'm a recent graduate from King's College London. Um, I read for a degree in geography and um, this coming September I'll also be reading for my masters in geopolitics at King's as well. Um, so in recent years I've conducted a lot of social science research um, in the global north and south with, with institutions like um, the British Council and after my masters I'll be embarking on a career in geopolitical risk analysis and um, I graduated from the University of Warwick's pathway to law program and summer school in um, August 2018. So yeah, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have and happy to virtually meet you all. Great, thanks so much, Jan. Um, why don't we hear from Ashley next? Hi everyone, I'm Ashley. Um, when I was in sixth form, I did the Sutton Trust summer school in 2015, although it looked quite different from this. It was all in person rather than virtually. Um, and I also did quite science-y A-levels. So I did biology, chemistry, maths, music. And my original plan was to do something biology re related at uni. Um, but then I did a bit of a U-turn and I decided actually I wanted to do music instead. Um, so I did music at Cambridge and I graduated in 2019. And by the end of my degree, I decided that actually music was not really what I wanted to go into at all. So I took a year out to um, kind of decide what I wanted to do. And I applied for lots of different jobs. Um, and in the end, I went for the Teach First training program. And I'm now a maths teacher in Portsmouth. Great, right. what a unique uh, journey. I can't wait to hear more about kind of how you made all those decisions. Um, Chloe, how about you? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chloe Bingham and I work in uh, the TV and film industries mainly um, as a creative freelancer. Uh, so what that means is I freelance between uh, a range of different um, roles, which I'll get into in a second. Um, in terms of my background, so I did the Sutton Trust US program in the second year it was running, so in 2013, uh, finishing in 2014. And the plan was to study in the US, uh, but that didn't work out because I messed up one of my AS levels. Um, so instead, after that, I decided that I'd go to university in the UK. I took a gap year because um, I knew I wanted to work in TV and it's a very um, competitive industry. So I took a gap year in order to try and get a role to network and build up my contacts. And so I was successful in applying for the Channel 4 apprenticeship programme. Uh, worked at Channel 4 on their Channel 4 skills team for a year, um, helping recruit for all of their entry level schemes, such as the apprenticeship programme I was on, work experience, graduate scheme, production training scheme, etc. Um, and yeah, spent that year traveling around the UK, hosting events for new talent looking to get into the industry. Um, and also, yeah, doing the help and shortlist and do all the recruitment. Um, so then finished that and I decided to go to Glasgow and I uh, did a film and television studies degree and got quite heavily involved in extracurricular stuff whilst I was there. Uh, graduated in 2019 and then, um, yeah, started freelancing. Um, so went straight into working as a role, um, so working, sorry, as an assistant producer for a children's media company. So as part of that role, I would uh, write, uh, basically, like, sorry, develop our ideas for um, what's called toy play. So we were actually working with toys and uh, companies such as Mattel, who own Feynman Sam, uh, would send us their toys and we'd create like interactive narrative content with the toys. So yeah, we'd uh, create concepts and then uh, develop those concepts, make them into scripts, and then go all the way through to filming these little like five minute episodes that would like highlight the features that highlight the features of the toys and um, so did that for a while and now um yeah I've done a range of roles since and currently I have two jobs I'm working as a product manager for Think Bigger and Think Bigger is uh, a creative uh consultancy um and organization essentially that helps new talent get into the film and tv industries and I'm also working as a researcher for Verizon slash uh Yahoo Finance on a new pod well sorry it's not new on a podcast series called Chamber Breakers so yeah uh, that sounds so cool. There are so many things you did I didn't even know existed as jobs. That sounds, can't wait to hear more about them. Um, yeah. Great. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, um, Frank, introduce yourself. Hey guys. Uh, hey everyone. Um, hope you guys are enjoying summer school so far or the Sutton Trust program so far. Um, so yeah, so I'm Frank. Uh, I was at the University of Nottingham. I did a degree in uh, medical physiology. Uh, I think I saw some people in the chat saying that they're there. Um, for summer school. So guys, hope you guys are having a great time. Um, I sort of like, again, went through university, but sort of pivoted away from sciences. So I currently work uh, with advertising agencies, um, 
specifically when it comes to when they want to work with new clients, I kind of help facilitate the clients meeting the agencies and the process and the fun stuff that sort of happens in between there. Um, usually quite busy, quite um, quite an active role. So yeah, so really enjoy that being involved in sort of making the creative work. So the adverts, the adverts on TV, on the radio, a lot of stuff on social media, which I think obviously everyone will know about. Um, that's kind of like my day to day. And whilst I was at university, I actually spent a lot of time working um, with the Sutton Trust summer schools. So when they were all in person and people would come to the university and we'd work with them, I'd be one of the people in bright, bright coloured um, polos, sort of like helping you um, get a full experience of what university life is like. So it's actually really nice to kind of like come back and, and help out um, via via Zoom, via the magic of Zoom. So yeah, so looking forward to having a good chat. Hey, awesome. Um, thank you all. Um, and again, thanks again for um, uh, giving up your time this Wednesday afternoon. Um, so yeah, well, let's just get straight into some of the questions we got um, before uh, before we started. Um, so I think you all have all kind of had um, yeah, quite a divergent um, career paths. So I was just kind of wondering when you first started university, what were, um, did you kind of feel any pressure to study the subjects that you did? Or how did you come to the decision to study um, to um, yeah study what you did in your degree? Um, why don't we start with um, Ashley? Yeah, I, I can start off. So um so like I said, I I did my science A levels um, and I planned to do something biology related. And at the end of year twelve, I got my AS results back, and my worst subject was chemistry. And it was by no means a bad grade. It just kind of stuck out a lot as my worst subject. So I thought, well, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm not going to do chemistry to, to A-level. Um, and it's definitely possible to do science degrees without doing chemistry. You don't need chemistry A-level to do a science degree at uni. But the degrees I was looking at, it seemed like chemistry made your application a lot stronger. So I thought that instead... Um, I would bin the science idea and do music instead, which was actually my, my best A-level. And um, I don't know if you kind of had advice when choosing A-levels or, or degree options, but I was always told it should be a balance of what you like and what you're good at. And I'd only thought about what I was good at. I didn't actually really consider if I genuinely liked it or not, um, uh, but I, I discovered that by the time I got there, which was, to be honest, a little bit too late. Um, and I think as well, music is, depending what university you go to, it, it, it's quite different um, depending on where you go. Um, so at Cambridge, it's very academic. It's an essay-based subject. You're in the library reading books and writing essays. Um, and a lot of people didn't really understand that, um, especially my parents didn't really understand why I would choose to do a music degree when it had always been just sort of a hobby of mine um, and there was one term where so I play the flute and there was one term where I decided I wasn't going to bring my flute to uni because um, there was just a lot of stuff to carry and my mum was horrified she thought I was going to fail because she just assumed that I played the flute all day when actually I was writing essays um, so it was quite hard to to explain what I actually did at uni and like justify my decision um, but yeah, that's that's kind of how I came to choose that subject. Yeah, definitely. I hear that. I think it's quite a yeah, quite a common experience for people to feel like they have to justify their choice of degrees, especially to their parents. Um, does anyone else on the panel have anything? Jen, I see you nodding there. Um, yeah, so I guess for reference, um, the A-levels that I did were economics, um, English literature and history. Um, and I guess I chose them because um, I was advised to take facilitating subjects that could be applied to many different fields. And, you know, at 16 years old, making these choices, I wasn't really sure um, what I wanted to do. Um, my parents had wanted me to be either a lawyer or a doctor, which I'm sure many, um, you know, people of colour can um, understand is quite a, a daunting task um, to consider. So I um, did the Pathways to Law um, programme with the Sutton Trust. 
um, and I applied for um, international development in the end um, and didn't meet the grades. Um, and in the end, I ended up adjusting to geography at King's, um, which was actually a blessing in disguise. So I didn't actually choose um, my pathway. It was sort of chosen for me. Um, but in the end, it was a blessing in disguise because I was able to um, get so much more from university experience. So I guess one thing I would say to the students who are on this panel you know, even if you don't know what you're doing, even if you're feeling a lot of pressure to, um, you know, take specific subjects, um, don't worry. Um, it's not the end of the world. Um, for my GCSEs, I think I only um, hit my target grade once out of the 12 GCSEs that I did. And, you know, one of my A-levels, I didn't meet the requirements. So everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Um, and now I'm still, you know, at a very fantastic university doing what I find so fulfilling. So, you know, what might feel like the end of the world when you're 16 really doesn't matter when you're 21 and you've just graduated and you've got your whole life ahead of you. So that's just one thing to think about. Um, and don't bow down to the pressure. Just do what um, makes you feel like you and um, it will fall in place in the end. Wow, that is, that is such encouraging words. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, Frank, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> a, a, dri a massive driving factor, I think um, Jan and Ash basically, basically talked about it was when it came to choosing subjects was literally my parents, like, well, my mum specifically, I think it was like, as soon as I came out of the room, it was like uni, like that was always the sort of like pathway and, and, and track for her um, and for me really. So, I mean, I didn't really, I think now I think the, the, the beauty of so much information being available to so many different people is the fact that you can kind of be a bit more clued up on stuff. So whereas me, I, I was kind of had a single track in front of me and kind of like went down it um, without ever really sort of considering a lot of stuff. So I think 100% words to Jan, like use use a lot of the information that's available to you. I think Sutton Trust is a wicked sort of um, library of information. And if, if you guys can reach out to, to Sutton Trust alumni to, to have that conversation and, hey, I'm thinking about this and it, it, nothing is set in stone. Like there's always time to kind of like figure stuff out. Um, yeah, I think um, parents were a massive driving factor for, for, for my study and obviously kind of like since leaving uni, I think once you kind of sometimes once you're in the track and I think actually going back, I think the the the, the pressure or the, the wanting for you to kind of like have those engineer, doctor, lawyer, I think is, is trying to make sure that you guys have stability. I think ultimately that's where it comes from. And I think again, the beauty of having um, loads of information is you can sort of point to other people and who've kind of taken not necessarily the engineer lawyer doctor route and are still successful i think there's masses and masses of people across loads of different industries that do sciences or do sort of art subjects and they're still really really successful and i think if you can kind of arm yourself with that information then hopefully you don't get stuck down the track that might not necessarily be the thing that you want to do. maybe sometimes it will be so then it's just like a perfect union but other times there's loads of information to make sure that you're super clued up on um, alternative routes, if, if that's something you want to think about, which I wish I kind of like had when I was a bit younger as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really great point. Um, I think we'll come back to that in a second. But first, like, Chloe, I wanted to hear from you. How was it? Um, did your parents have any, anything to say about you studying film and t television studies or how was that for you? Um, so no, actually, um, I think unlike everyone else, I felt no pressure. Um, my parents have always been quite free in the fact they just let us do what we wanted, like pursue our passions, essentially. Um, so I think from about the age of 11, actually, I've wanted to be a film director. So <laughs> I've kind of just been like on a path to pursuing it since then and properly like pursuing it since I was about 16. Um, so yeah, it's actually, I actually changed my degree whilst I was on my gap year at Channel 4. Um, because obviously, as I mentioned earlier, I was doing a lot of recruitment. Like for instance, I was recruiting the runners that were working um, on like our partner productions with Box Television. Um, and so I read, sorry, every, sorry, I realized essentially, um, that a lot of the people I was um, helping recruit essentially they um, some of them had like film and tv degrees and stuff like that and therefore had experience through, the, through their degrees which then meant that they didn't need to then like work for like one or two years as a runner which is like the most entry-level position in the tv industry um, to then essentially um, before they can move up and so that's actually why I changed my degree on my gap year and I reapplied and I applied to Glasgow for film and tv because uh, initially I'd applied for English at Leeds and that was my first choice um, because yeah, I basically didn't want to work as a runner uh, for the first two, two years. Like, um, I know you can call me like, I guess, aspirational. I was like, I think I can start a bit higher than that. Um, so yeah, I, um, I completely pivoted essentially. Um, and I think, yeah, so my parents, there was no pressure in terms of like me um, 
essentially yeah what I study like my parents have I guess quite a lot of confidence in me and my decisions I guess they feel like I guess they raised like a smart child so um so there was no pressure there um what I think what they were a bit concerned about though is that I decided to do a television studies degree which was mainly theoretical as opposed to production degree um and they were thinking essentially like why would you want to do a degree that's mainly theoretical when obviously in your industry it's all about like your practical skills but I knew going into that course that that was like it was something I intentionally picked because um, I'd done this thing previously where I used to attend red carpet premieres and interview the talent. So like interview the actors, directors, et cetera. Um, and I realized that when I interviewed them, if they were to flip the question around, like to me, essentially like background and ask me about like my opinion about um, different films, different TV shows and stuff, I'd realized that like a lot of what I'd grown up watching was like Hollywood stuff. So I really wanted to have that theoretical understanding of like his other history of film and TV and like get a good grounding and understand essentially. Um, so that's why I did a theoretical theoretical degree and also I knew at Glasgow there was like the oldest student television station in the world um Gus the student like so it's like Glasgow University student television station and so I knew I could get involved with them get the practical skills that way and also do my own stuff uh through jobs and stuff um and yeah build up my skill set that way so I think that's their that was their only concern but um I was able to like reassure them that like I knew exactly what I was doing essentially so yeah Nice. Um, yeah, no, that sounds really incredible. And it does make and have make such a difference to like have um people around you supporting you to do that. So I'm really happy to tell you you did have that um level of support at home. Um so a few of you have kind of mentioned how important it was to have influences or see people around you doing things that you didn't kind of um know about growing up. Did anyone want to talk about maybe some um ways to explore and discover maybe slightly less traditional paths if you're not already kind of exposed to them? Kind of an open question if anyone does have any insight onto that. Um, I guess, sorry, I'll just jump back in. Um, so I think for me, obviously, so like to get into like, yeah, the film and TV industry and especially creative industries quite generally, um, it's obviously very competitive. Uh, so I think what works for me is basically just doing a lot of research um, so it was through doing research that I was able to find, for instance, the Channel 4 scheme, uh, the apprenticeship scheme that I ended up applying for. Um, and actually on that, like I was quite fortunate, I guess, that I had like a decent background um, in terms of like, I'd done a lot of relevant work to the role I ended up doing. I was very like, I'd already been campaigning a lot about helping like um, young people get um, work experience in the industries they were interested in like because obviously like um, all of our backgrounds I assume obviously we're not connected like when we don't have like loads of connections in those certain industries um, and so, yeah I did a lot of research essentially that allowed me to find the channel 4 scheme um, and I guess nowadays I think there's a lot more out there especially online there's so many for instance like Instagram um, Instagram platforms such as like I like network and run the check etc and there's so many like film and tv Facebook groups um, so I think there's just so much information out there. It's just about doing your research and finding out like what's available to you. Um, in our industry as well, there's also an organization called Screen Skills, which will tell you about all the different roles and offer in our industry and how to get started in them, et cetera. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just about like doing that research, not feeling afraid to reach out to people who you see like doing like uh, a role or a similar role to what you aspire to or just work in the field you aspire to, because I think a lot of people will have time for you, know, like they will sit down with you and like give you advice, so yeah. Yeah, definitely, 100%. It is really just about putting yourself out there and um, having that open mind to, yeah, kind of see what else um, is out there that you didn't already, originally think of. Um, did anyone else um, have anything to feed in on that? Otherwise, we've got um, quite a few questions I can um, move on to. If not, we can also come back to that later. Um, but we did have a few um, students kind of asking about the question of whether or not to move away from home for university. Um, so, you know, there's kind of... Um, Kind of quite a big thing like that um came out was you know did you feel that um if you did move um or stay uh in your hometown um did you feel like you had to adjust to different levels of um kind of ethnic and racial diversity and if that kind of played a role in your uh, university experience oh quite a big one just going in <laughs> in there but um yeah if that is an experience uh, anyone had and would like to talk about um yeah please do feel free to unmute and share yeah happy to jump in on that one if that's all right um, so yeah I grew up in Warwickshire and went to a school that was very sort of um, white dominated so I was one of the few people of colour in my school um, which was actually very difficult growing up because um, I noticed that a lot of the opportunities and the support um, wasn't really made available to us and actually my teachers actually discouraged me from applying to King's because they said that it would be too competitive for the likes of me they said um, which was obviously a very big bombshell to hear when you're young and you just want to you know grow and um, move to a new place and um, 
but in the end I got in and um, one of the things that helped me to um, help my parents with the transition um, because for me it wasn't as big a transition compared to my parents um, I'm the first born so they were like stay at home you know we'll buy you a car if you go to the nearest um, university like stay at home um, but I think for those people who are struggling to sort of convince their parents um, one of the things that I would um, definitely say sit them down have a conversation with them about why um, a big move to a different place to a different university might be beneficial for you um, in the long term and for your career and um, you know for most people I would say that you know they come from very happy and um, positive homes so usually parents would um, understand your perspective from that um, and I would say that moving away to the big city um, in London um, was a bit of a jump in terms of um, the diversity um, again coming from sort of a white dominated school to a very internationally diverse uh, university such as King's um, was very different but um, it but ultimately it opened my worldview and it was a very positive um, experience. Um, and, you know, you're always going to come across people who might be discriminatory or um, racist, but it's just about, you know, how you handle yourself and understand that that's a reflection on their character and not yours. Um, so I, uh, I know that there's a lot of people of colour <laughs> on this um, call and, you know, throughout life, unfortunately, it is going to be um, something that we will um, be fighting against. It's not always um, possible to avoid it. But again, it's just about upholding yourself and understanding that you're here for a reason. You earned, you know, your position in this um, school, this place, this workplace, wherever you might find yourself. And, you know, using your identity to empower you as opposed to diminish your voice. So never forget that there is so much power in being a person of colour and, um, yeah, paving the way for others as well. Um, so, yeah, if anyone wanted to jump in on that, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. I mean, how'd you follow? That was. I mean, yeah. I mean, all all of the above. I think my my experience of it was sort of the opposite way around. So I I've always grown up in London. I don't know if you lot can tell by my accent. Um, accent. Um, I've always grown up in London. Uh, and then so obviously going up to the Midlands for uni. That was li literally my first experience of sort of leaving the M25. Like I'm still rubbish at geography, but I know where Nottingham is on a map, and I know where London is. That's the extent of my world world geography. So maybe Jan, you can help me out with that as well. But like, um, just just speaking on the sort of the racial identity bit of it as well. So like, I, I kind of grew up in a school and, and went to a school in sixth form where, you know, um, ethnicity was, was it was so normal to me. It was so like, I, I always say like, I, ne I never realized the minority part of ethnic minority until I left london to go to uni because i was like no nah, like between my friends my family the people i see and just everyone like it, it was such a diversity so when i i, I do remember like my first couple of weeks of, of uni i was just like bro like where's where's all the where's all the where's all the people of color like i don't i don't see it i don't see it so but i think but here's here's the sort of i guess a uh, really good bit about that as well so i think i've got lifelong friends that i otherwise might not have met because i went to uni in a completely different city um lifelong friends and i think finding your tribe so what you find like birds of a feather flock together and yeah you can you guys can you can sort of like stay in your town and, and, and sort of hang around with people that are always like you or sometimes it can be a case and i think this can happen if you do stay in your city and just move to a different place or, or, or go to a different place but i think there's always a, a real magic that happens when you do kind of interact with people that you otherwise might not necessarily have had the chance to which is why I'm always a massive proponent and a massive fan of listen, push yourself, like um, go to the best place that you can, like that will really challenge you and, and, and speak to your skills. And I think what you find is you will gravitate towards people that are like you have the same similar goals, similar ambitions. And that doesn't necessarily just have to be like the same color, color as your skin. It's like literally, like I said, you'll have friends and be exposed to loads of different people that you otherwise might not have met just purely because of the, um, the opportunity that I think sometimes going to a different city or a different place um, presents itself. So I think I'm always a massive fan for it. Um, um, thinking about um, the, again, sort of the racial, ten not racial tension, but racial questions that I think happen. I think now I think the world is in a place where they're probably the most ready to have those kind of conversations that, that they've ever been before. Um, again, not all of my um, interactions were positive, but I think what you have to do is that's a, that's a real small minority. I think um, the, the opportunity sometimes to share your culture or share a bit about yourself that other people might not have necessarily had the opportunity to see as well. I think 
again, if I can teach one, they teach another two, then kind of hopefully we get into a place where um, people are a lot more accepting and a lot more okay with the fact that, yeah, we're, we're from different places, but ultimately my value as a person isn't diminished and yours isn't more than mine just because we're sort of like different. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Go on, Ashley. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think my experience is probably quite similar to Frank's. I'm also a, a born and bred Londoner, and um, my school was quite um, sheltered, might be the word. It was very much a bubble. I went to a girls' school, and it was also um, very kind of ethnically diverse there were four white people in my class everyone else was like personal color so um it was some like just an environment that I'd grown up in and was something that was completely normal to me um then going up to Cambridge was a big culture shock um my my first kind of thought in freshers week was I didn't I didn't quite understand why people were so obsessed with going to the pub because um, my parents and like my friend's parents, they like they, they didn't really participate in pub culture. And that was something um, that was a bit of a, a shock to me. And um, my kind of identity, I didn't really think about it that much um, until Cambridge do kind of formal dinners. Um, and one college was holding a formal dinner, which was specifically for BME people. And I thought, wow, that's great. I'll sign up for that. Um, and I was looking through who could come with me and I realized actually all my friends are white I've got no one to go with which is not not a great kind of feeling um, I mean I did manage to find people to go with in the end um, but it was that moment it kind of dawned on me like this this kind of environment is very different to to the one that I I grew up in um, and I'd also echo what what Frank said about kind of finding your sort of people not necessarily from like similar backgrounds to you but kind of like-minded people university is such a big place um, and there's so many different societies and you're you're bound to find people who are who are kind of your your kind of people I guess yeah definitely just on that we've actually had a question from um uh, Mei Yang, who kind of, yeah, speaking of the idea of finding your tribe, she asks, uh, or they ask if you have any tips in terms of building um, a network out at university. Um, yeah, I can answer that. So I think, um, I think, I'm not sure if she means like network in terms of, do you mean like, like actually, did she mean like, um, sorry, uh, professional network or just like network in terms of like, uh, uh, what do you call it in terms of like network of peers who have similar interests sorry uh, do you know? uh, they didn't clarify but um let's go with building out a network of peers for now and then we can go into professional networking later on yeah sure actually I can answer both so I think in terms right. of um building a professional network so I think for me like I said I got involved like so obviously I did the film tv degree and I got involved in the student television station um and that was quite a good uh way basically to uh, meet people like myself who had an interest in getting involved in film and TV or sorry who had an interest sorry in pursuing a career in film and TV um, and so yeah it was just like basically joining society and meeting like like-minded peers obviously also talking to people on your course because I feel like some people like you can do a degree and it ended up happening to me as well where you don't necessarily talk to people on your course until like essentially you get you get put into a group project and so I think it's just about actually like having those conversations like um in lectures and stuff like inviting people to hang out outside the lectures um, and genuinely getting to know them as opposed to just being the person that you sit next to like in the lecture um and then besides that as well um, I think in terms of like building a peer network so um, yeah I can relate to basically what everyone just said like um, about their experiences essentially um, going to university um, as a person of colour in a totally different environment like for instance obviously yeah again from my accent you guys can hear I'm also a Londoner um, and I went to university in Scotland which is probably the whitest country in the UK like it was like it was so ridiculous um, like literally Glasgow I'm not even joking I think the stats from 2014 it's like 96% white um, so um, I would be in the lecture, for instance, and like there would be 450 people, and I was like one of like three black people with that, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a bit crazy. Um, and what I did, I didn't realize again, like because I'd grown up, I went, I also went to a girls' school that was like uh, very ethnic, like, ethnically, I just think it's a very ethnic school actually. Like for instance, my school was like 95% black. 
um that's probably what one percent of white people and then like four percent um everything else essentially and then I went to like um I, I guess I was a bit prepared because I went to a very white sixth form uh but that wasn't the most welcome environment and so all my friends still ended up being black and I was only 20 black students that says a lot um <laughs> out of 240 and so what I did in my first year I quickly sought out um the African and Caribbean society um and found like peers there um and also I made a habit of like basically introducing myself to every black person I met because <laughs> you wouldn't make friends otherwise like who are black um and so that really helped um and to this day I now can say I have like a good few black friends from university at least three <laughs> um, and then besides that I think as well to echo what Frank said earlier I think um having done that like having gone through that experience also yeah allows you to meet people who you never have met otherwise and to like um yeah meet like like-minded people from very different backgrounds to yourself um who yeah you'd never have met if you hadn't have gone to like to that university and had that experience essentially so like now some of my best friends like one's from France uh one is from Botswana one is from Lithuania one's from Romania and so you get to meet yeah I got to meet all these different people because like Although the university itself wasn't very diverse in terms of like British students, um, they had like a very like good international population. So you got to meet people from all over. Um, and so I think it's just like, I guess about like thinking about like what's really important to you, what are your interests, and then seeking out those societies or groups, whatever it is. I know obviously it's a bit more difficult online, um, but I guess there will be obviously that will societies and stuff will still, still run online or even just join the Facebook group. Um, and yeah, just don't be afraid to like start a conversation with someone. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I echo all of those. I think those are all great tips. Um, did anyone else have uh, any other tips that they wanted to add to that? Did Chloe kind of cover, cover all the boxes? Frank, go on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no. I was just going to say um, societies are like, a ma I'm a massive fan of societies because, um, again, like, I think I kind of like got super involved in my ACS, or the African Caribbean Society, and like was president of uh, 2000 and what was it 2010 to 2011 so yeah but there's not like an official office or anything but it was it was, it was nice but like, like again and it's just like a wicked way of kind of meeting people so I was in the African Caribbean Society the first aid society um I think I did roller roller skating as well and it's just again just throw yourself into opportunities to meet people I mean I can't roller skate now so please don't ask me but like you you there's again it's just all of these different ways of trying to meet and and, and find out and network I guess essentially with different people with the same interests and same passions and then hopefully that makes you feel more connected to the institution that you're in because of again like the connections that you build with people yeah definitely definitely um great so we've got uh, quite a few questions coming in now and um, so just in the interest of uh, trying to get to as many as we can before the um before our time ends um, we've had a few questions about kind of academics, broadly speaking. So um, one has come through um, kind of about how you've dealt with imposter syndrome. Um, if anyone has experienced that and would like to speak on it, I'm seeing a few nods. Please feel free to unmute. Um, yeah, happy to take that one on. Um, so when I applied for Kings. Um, nobody else in my um, school really considered that. Um, they all relatively stayed within the Midlands. Um, so I was sort of the only person who wanted to branch out and move to a different region in the country. Um, so when I actually got my acceptance at Kings, I was like, what, me? You know, especially because, you know, I'd had these teachers telling me that, um, you know, I wasn't suited for the school. It was too competitive. Um, I, you know, there was no chance for me to get in and to actually have this opportunity. I wanted to prove them wrong. And, you know, not just for not just because I wanted to have something to say to them, but for me, for me, too. Um, and I knew that. Um, you know, as a person of colour, um, it, it was I was representing, you know, a very um, large population um, of, of the country. And I wanted to make sure that I was um, making the most of it. And um, the first few weeks that I spent um, at university, there was major imposter syndrome. And I, you know, questioned whether I was even good enough to be at the university. Um, you know, my first um, grade back, I think was a 58, um, which is sort of a really low grade um, um, in, in my standards anyway and um, I just didn't feel as though um, I was cut out for it and um, it was uh, really difficult actually for my mental health the first few weeks you know all 
full, fully transparent on this webinar here. Um, but I think in the end, what really helped me um, and is sort of echoing what everyone's already said is about finding your tribe and finding the right people who are going to bring out the best in you, um, both socially, professionally, um, academically, um, and actually taking some time to embrace the fact that you're outside of your comfort zone and asking yourself, how can I move myself and progress um, in a positive and healthy way? Um, and some of the things that I did for myself was reaching out in the form of societies, um, joining in, in a lot of um, ambassadorship programs, um, which meant that I was interacting with a lot of people, both within King, King's and the wider University of London community, and um, just buckling down and working hard. Um, and now as a graduate, um, I feel like um, that imposter syndrome actually helped me. It sort of propelled me to make the most of my university experience. And, you know, what was initially a very daunting um, period of my life, um, I'm very grateful for now because I feel as though I needed that extra push to really get to um, where I am today. So, you know, if anyone here is feeling um, unsure or uneasy or not really sure whether they're cut out for the next stage in their life, um, have patience um, in yourself and compassion as well, um, because it's, you know, a learning curve for everyone and everyone, you know, um, gets through this barrier one way or another. And it's just about being honest with yourself about what, what you want to do and what you can do to help yourself progress and get through this. But yeah, you're not alone if you feel as though um, you've got this impossible syndrome I think um, many people feel this way um, no matter what your background is and no matter what you're studying and where you are so yeah yeah I think that was really beautifully said and um, did anyone have anything to add to that um yeah I think throughout the whole three years of my degree I think I probably suffered from imposter syndrome and um it's it's probably not a coincidence that I'm not really friends with that many people uh, from my course because it's it's a really small course. It's only fifty something people in a year, and um, I'd kind of turned up to uni, kind of thinking like, yeah, I'm like I'm pretty good. Like I've got into Cambridge. Like I can't I can't be that bad. And um, meeting everyone in my subject, Dave or sort of either been in national youth orchestra or they've been to all like the kind of Saturday schools in London or they they knew each other from kind of music courses that they'd done and everyone seemed to already know each other and they were all already part of that kind of music circle which I wasn't a part of because I'd only ever done kind of orchestra in, in school and I'd, I'd never really done anything outside of that. So I think from day one, um, it wasn't particularly helpful that I already felt like a little bit of an outsider um, because everyone knew everyone already. Um, and I think that was probably one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy my degree as much because I, I, I felt like I was kind of one step behind everyone else already. And like, but there's always going to be people with more experience than you. There's always going to be people better than you at uni. Like it's, it, it's a big place. You're going to meet lots of um, different people. Um, but I, I really felt that on my course, especially because it, it was, it was so small. Um, but I think looking back, um, I definitely let that imposter syndrome kind of get the better of me. Um, and there were times when, I thought like I, I wasn't good enough to do something or there was a particular course I wanted to do, but I didn't want to take that course because I knew other people who were doing it and they'd be much better than me and, and stuff like that. So it, as, as hard as it is, um, even if it doesn't completely go away, even if you can't completely kind of shake it off, I, I'd really advise to try and stop that kind of voice in your head I like I know it's difficult and I didn't quite do that at uni um but you've just got to ignore that that little voice in your head like especially if you're applying for quite um competitive courses or, or like good unis people have gone through your UCAS application they've read through everything and you they they have made a conscious decision to to let you in you you deserve to be there um so I try and keep that in mind yeah, definitely. Just okay. super, super quickly on that, on that, because I, I, lo I love Ash's point there. And I think there's, 
there's a there's a thing about sort of um embracing the space that you're in do you get what i mean so it, it's like look you being you there's no one else that's like it. wait I'm, i sound really kind of like um philosophical and stuff i don't mean it but it's, it's just like your path and i think even abby i think you started the, the sort of chat by saying it, it's like your path is your path no one else can do it because it's specifically the choices and, and decisions that you make and i think there's a power in there's a power in um owning that and i think sometimes it possibly decision you know, like being probably a little bit older than um people like i've got to be honest like it's it's going to be part of it sometimes you will think to yourself oh am i good enough to have this opportunity that i do have but what you i think the important thing to try and remember is the fact it's like as she was saying it's like you know there are people who have you know ho hopefully chosen you to be in the position that you're in and all of the skills and sometimes we can be our own biggest critic like, like you can sort of achieve as, the things that you do and not give yourself the credit that you might do if somebody else was if somebody else had done it so i, I just kind of like really try and impress on people you guys that are powerful in yourselves um hopefully any space you're in go in confidently knowing that no one else can do the things that you do because you do them and, and and that's that's your power that's your space so imposter syndrome unfortunately is probably something that's it'll be people a lot more senior than us and a lot more junior as well. like it's just a thing but i think it's hopefully try not to let your internal voice be too harsh to yourself so yeah i just wanted to add that yeah all, all well said I, I don't think i would have anything to add and um, yeah no definitely i think it is definitely about just making sure that you do find that support if you do have those feelings that remembering that there is support out there for you so yeah definitely um yeah well said all around um so i'm trying to think so we've got a few questions in for um specific people um if you wouldn't mind answering so i'll go through some of those now and then i'll get back to kind of the um, more uh, open uh, general questions um so question for um ashley um how if you don't mind answering how did you find the level of um inclusivity at cambridge um do you think it's becoming more diverse or did you very much feel like a minority there if you wouldn't mind touching on that a bit that is a a good question um in terms of the kind of the music department, it's such a small department. Um, but from what I saw, I was the only uh, Southeast Asian on in my year. And I think possibly, I think there was one other Chinese lady in the faculty. That's all I saw. Didn't see any black people, not a single, oh no, sorry. There was one black student, one black student in the whole music department, including all the staff, all the undergrads, all the postgrads that I saw. Uh, so obviously there is um, work to be done in that department, but music is quite, it's such a niche subject. I don't think that's um, kind of representative of the whole university. Um, and I, I kind of touched on before, so there was the BME formal um, and there were lots and lots of different societies that you could you could join um, depending on, on kind of your, your background and your culture. Um, I, I didn't experience any kind of racism and I don't know anyone who did experience any kind of racism, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were, there were cases, but I, I was lucky enough not, not to have come across um, any of that. Um, I definitely did feel like a minority, especially that, I mean, there were lots of kind of Chinese people about, but they were all international students. And I felt not kind of, I, I didn't feel like, like I was part of that kind of, um, that kind of circle. Mm. But I think I, I never felt uncomfortable. Um, but it was something I was quite aware of. And there's definitely um, work to be done by by the university in that kind of in that kind of area. Sorry, can I mute for a second there? Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your experience there. Um, of course, just a you know, necessary disclaimer: your experience is your own, and um, you know whoever's listening on the panel doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the exact same experience. So just um, to preface it with that. 
Um, but we also have had a question in um, asking if anyone has experienced um, kind of different treatment by professors specifically, but I suppose we can open that up to kind of more generally speaking, um, experience different treatment due to um, your race or ethnicity or any other part of your identity. Um, if not, that's completely fine. We can move on. But if you did have um, an experience or know someone who did and wanted to share about that, um, I think there are a few people in chat who would be um, interested to hear about it. Um, but if not, we can definitely um, move on. Okay, that's fine. Um, and also a reminder that, um, yeah, we do still have an STO chat where we have uh, lots of ambassadors there waiting to hear from you as well. So do feel free to um, explore and see if there's anyone there who um, might be able to answer your questions as well. Um, and kind of, I guess, kind of in a similar vein, um, Grace asks, um, what would your advice be to someone who fears uh, facing uh, assimilation and is in a position where they feel like they're restricted by their school and what they can achieve because they are a POC? Um, I think Jan kind of um, touched on that in some of her responses earlier, but um, I don't know if you want to add to that or if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, yeah, happy to elaborate on what I was saying earlier. Um, so as I said, yeah, I came from a very sort of white dominated school. Um, I felt as though, um, yeah, my school was very much geared towards helping um, a certain type of student. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't fit that description quite as much. Um, so I did actually feel as though my um, potential was hindered. And I think this is why I wanted to, um, you know, strive even harder to get into what I knew was a good school, a good university, because I knew that that would be a place where I could grow. I felt um, when I arrived at King's, I could finally sort of stretch my legs, um, spread my wings and really fly. Um, because the school that I went to, it was the Catholic State School. Um, yeah, they really catered to a certain sort of um, identity. And I think with that, um, unfortunately, it's um, a really unfortunate situation for many students across the country. But um, you can't allow, um, you know, the opportunities that come to you um, to be brought forward to you by the school that you're in. Sometimes it really does involve taking the initiative to go out there to speak to people on platforms like um, LinkedIn or, you know, the STO um, and really um, taking that initiative to see what which industries might fit you what opportunities are out there and um yeah it's just unfortunate that that is still the case but there are up and coming um programs out there that you know are helping sort of um vain students to um achieve uh, more and sort of secure their potential um so it's not as though there's nothing available out there um but it's just about believing in yourself and having the confidence that you know these teachers or these um you know adults in my life um there's that's only one portion um, of people who have the specific view on you that's not a reflection of who you are or your potential it's really you know not really anything to do with you um, if you really think about it sometimes um, it really is just an unfortunate um, uh, situation in society and I think it's really good to see that that is being challenged and and there are conversations that are being started to change this narrative um, but until this narrative is fully changed um, change is reliant on people like us people of color who you know go out there make the most of the opportunities out there and take the initiative um, and I think being on this webinar um, listening to different positionalities and narratives is a really good way to start um, so yeah we're definitely um, recommend that you reach out to those um, people on here on this webinar I'm more than happy to answer any further questions even after this webinar um, just because it is such a, a, a topic that is so close to heart um, and I did feel as though only did when I went to a um, higher education institution at King's did I really feel like I met my potential and um, I wouldn't want the people on this webinar to have to wait that long um, so if I can do anything to sort of help your journey yeah I'm more than happy to help. Great, that's great. And yeah, we can definitely, um, I know we've got quite a few questions that we won't get to today, so we can definitely try to organise a way for you to answer those after the fact. Um, did anyone else have anything to add to that, um, add to that kind of line, um, that thread? Jan said it all, as, as, as always, great. <laughs> um, so um, we are kind of coming up to the end of the session. So I'll kind of have um, one more. And if you do have to head off, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, but we'll kind of um, end on um, what might be quite a nice like reflect, uh, re re 
reflective tone, I think. Um, Mame has asked, how has your, your perception of university changed from the first year of, um, of your degree to your last year? Um, I suppose, whatever state, um, state you're in now. Um, so yeah, take a moment to just kind of reflect on that and then um, we will go around everyone and then I think we can um, wrap up the session. Um, whoever would like to start first and has already collected their thoughts, please feel free to um, unmute and jump in. Tricky one. Um, so I think for me, I think it was basically, um, I guess I went in and I had like this idea, I guess, of like the kind of experience that I was going to have. Um, and I think like, I don't know, I think it definitely changed. So like, for instance, I went in and like, oh my gosh, I was one of those people and I had like a five year plan that I was working towards and it's ridiculous. And like by the end of like first year, that had gone out the window literally. Um, but I think, um, I think essentially what had happened was, I don't know, like, I guess, like, through being part of, like, initiatives such as the Certain Trust and stuff like that, I feel like you're surrounded by, like, people who are so driven, essentially, and who are so driven, who have, like, set paths they're working towards, and who kind of have, like, a, most of them have a clear idea as to where, like, what they're trying to, um, yeah, what they're trying to um, pursue, like, yeah, where they're trying to go, essentially, in life. Um, and I guess, like, once you get to university, you'll realise, although you might be that sort of person, and I definitely was, that, like, you, like obviously, university is a whole different experience, and, like, you'll be surrounded by peers who, like, um, who, like, I think it was, like, Ashley said earlier, a lot of people just want to go to the pub, and so I feel like, don't put, like, that pressure on yourself, essentially, um, to still, like, if you, if you do feel like you want to pivot, like, you want to change, um, and you want to ha basically have, a, just, like, more of a normal university experience, and you don't just want to, like, uh, just be studying all the time, or just, like, just focus on, like, trying to, like, complete your five-year plan, like um there's no pressure essentially so I feel like at the end of the day it's like your own unique experience and so uh just do whatever you feel um you feel is best for you at the time so like yeah like I said that plan went out the window um I decided to just focus on like getting to know my peers just making the most of the experience um and yeah essentially um just yeah really putting myself out there so I think like in my first year I probably spent too much time getting to know my flatmates considering that like I knew I wasn't going to be like friends with a lot of them by the end but like by second year I joined so many societies I was in like eight different societies in second year and one of the things that I, I um, one of the things that forced me to do that is that I'd ended up living alone in second year because like I lived in a studio flat and so I was forced to join all these societies make new friends and stuff like that and it was great for me like I did horse riding beekeeping ballroom dancing ACS um debating like it was brilliant like literally and I met some really cool people and some of my best friends through doing that um, so I think, yeah, it definitely changed in terms of like that experience of what I thought I was going to have and what it actually was. Um, and also as well, for me, I realized that my degree, uh, it was more for me, it was about just getting that experience and getting like, um, yeah, I guess like the history, um, the historical and theoretical understanding of film and TV. Um, but my degree, I always knew like once I started it, essentially, like they never gave us the skills we needed in terms of like pursuing like an actual like a career in the industry, like a practical career. Um, and so I feel like for me, that was just, again, do my own independent research, like reaching out to the people I've met on my gap year when I was working at Channel 4 and was networking and stuff. Um, and just making sure that I had that knowledge that I was like, I knew what I wanted to do and what I needed to do once I finished essentially. Um, so yeah, I think that's what it was for me. Also, sorry, I'm just gonna quickly answer a question that someone asked me about um, Glasgow. Um, so about, about that question, Grace, essentially. Um, so one of the things I considered when going to Glasgow uh, was essentially about societies, like I said, I'm a very active person. So sort of societies they had an offer um, it was essentially um, the different things they had off in relation to my actual course. Um, it was obviously whether it was a, like a really good course, essentially. Um, and in terms of finding settling in, um, yeah, I found it like I found it like fairly okay. Like I was fine. Um, and it was like I said, my my flatmates and like uh, people in my halls were really nice. And again, I think it's just about like basically if you don't feel like comfortable in that environment, like what, that you've ended up in, just yeah, finding those networks for yourself. So like throwing yourself out there, force yourself to join societies, force yourself to make new friends because at the end of the day it is on you. So I think if you want to apply to Glasgow um, and you, you're serious about it, then go ahead. Like um, I had a great experience and um, I'm sure if you went there, you could have that too. So yeah. Oh, wow, I feel so inspired. I, I want to go back to university again. <laughs> um, did anyone else want to um, share their thoughts uh, maybe a minute or two? On, yeah, reflecting on um, yeah, your university experience overall from your first year to your uh, last year or wherever you are now. Yeah, yeah, um, I'll, 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 I'll quickly try and go. I think um, in my first year, I thought uni was just going to be kind of lectures, uh, lab work, um, and it just 
I, but I think the thing that I think makes university such a rich experience, and I think which is why every, everyone who has the ability and the, the option to go, I think 100% do, because it's, yes, it is academically rigorous. There's, there's ways to kind of like delve in and, and dive deep academically but then there's so much that happens sort of to you as a person because it's I normally I guess um, typically 18 to 21 I, I think you change so much in that time anyway so I think there's so much to be said about the sort of personal pastoral cultural change that happens within you because of the place that you go to as well so I think that's definitely something that I realized between my first and third year and then just just lastly I think um the, the opportunities that kind of spring off the back of that I think in my head I just thought university men you automatically get a job but I think it's all of the skills that you develop you never know where they take you because I mean obviously myself using myself as, a, as an example I started off with a science degree kind of like again through connections and the work that I've done um, again working in creative industries slash advertising that I, I in my on my first year of, you know 100% couldn't have told you that that would be where I end up but I think there's, there's a there's a real um, I guess magic for lack of a hopefully that's not too cringy but like there's a real kind of um, wickedness that happens when you kind of go in get an incredible opportunity and experiences and then you sort of find out and plot out where that takes you so I think yeah be op be open to the surprise of the journey I think is, is probably a nice way to, to sum it up. Definitely well said well said um, Jan Ashley did you want to uh, jump in as well? Yeah, just to sort of jump um, onto what um, Frank said, I think that period between 18 to, one, to 21, um, there's a lot of changes that happen. And um, I think coming into university, I really wanted to make um, loads and loads of friends. I wanted my CV to be pristine with all, only the best opportunities out there. And um, I realized that was a very unrealistic um, perception to come into. I was very narrow minded coming into um, university, actually. And now that I've just graduated, I realized that, um, you know, to, uh, life is short, um, especially after the pandemic. And there's only so many um, things that you can devote your energy to. Um, so it's just about being really um, selective about the type of people you have around you, making sure that they're only very positive positive, healthy um, people that are going to be good for you and that you could be good for them too. Um, and in terms of the opportunities out there, um, yeah, try to not have too much of a narrow view, um, you know, because there are sometimes very many opportunities out there that might give you um, even better um, experiences and skills that might not um, appear on the surface at first. Um, and you could be missing out on a very fantastic opportunity because you're, you know, narrow minded about what you're going to devote your energy to. So um, I think for people who are still sort of learning to find their path in life, um, yeah, be selective about what you say yes and no to. Um, and that can be very difficult. But um, I guess one good thing is that the university process um, improves um, your ability to understand what you can say yes to and what you should say no to. Um, and I think that jump from 18 to 21 is daunting, um, but it's very much a really exciting and necessary change. So don't be afraid of it and just, yeah, trust the process. Yep, yeah, 100% trust the process, definitely. Um, and Ashley, do you want to um, finish, finish, finish us up? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think starting uni, I didn't, I didn't have a game plan or kind of any thoughts at all, to be honest, because um, the it, it seemed like just a, a kind of natural transition. I didn't really, it wasn't a conscious decision to go to university. It was just something I thought that I had to do. Um, but I think as well, it, there's quite a lot of um, kind of emphasis on freshers week and that's the week where you kind of like meet loads of people and have like a really great time um, and it is one week out of the three years and although uni does go it goes by very quickly but also three years is quite a long time you do not need to do everything in your first year you don't need to join every single society um, every single society as soon as you get in like it it's a long time to kind of discover who you are, um, what what your interests are, not just your degree, but like kind of stuff outside of your degree and just sort of figure out what what you want to do. And there will be people around you who seem to have their, their kind of game plan 
and they've got it all sorted out and they're going to do all these internships and be like a banker in the city and all this sort of stuff which is great but that's they're, they're actually quite a small minority most people don't really know what they're doing um and even by the end of your degree if you still don't know what you want to do that's fine because i i didn't have a clue at all um and it all worked out in the end um and i can see in the chat that someone um has asked about studying music at, at durham and i'll keep this really short because it's quite uh, niche but my my sister had actually graduated from durham last week um, and I didn't mean to scare you about not doing the Saturday classes and stuff. You, you don't need to do all those extra stuff. Um, I, I didn't, and it was fine. But I, I can speak to you later about that if you want to talk about that more. Uh, yeah. Hey. Oh, well, thank you so much. I think that was a really lovely note to end on. Um, yeah, so another massive, massive thank you to all the panellists for um, your insights and your wisdom, um, I think. Um, yeah, it's not just me who feels really motivated and inspired after this conversation. Um, and of course, thank you to um, all of you who attended for your um, really fantastic engagement and all your wonderful questions. Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we will um, do our best to um, try and find a way to um, get them either on um, Centrus Online or uh, social media. We will let you know how we, um, uh, how we do that. Um, and then before I close off, just a few really quick reminders from me. Um, uh, as we've mentioned a few times, STO chat is that they're available to you. We have a huge community of alumni who are there, um, just like uh, all of the lovely friendly ones on this panel who um, yeah, are really excited to answer your questions. Um, you can um, find that if you go on Centrust Online, there should be like a little um, pop up in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, so if you go there, um, you can um, yeah, browse through ambassadors um, and FAQs and um, all kinds of content so it's really really great place um, and another opportunity that I think is really exciting that we don't want you to miss out on um, is we've partnered with Causeway Education to provide you um, personal statement and application support. Um, one really exciting program is a one-to-one -one mentorship where you can apply for a mentor and get subject specific coaching um, and training and feedback on your personal statement and um, to make sure you get the most outstanding statement um, and you get that all for free with Centrist Online. Um, so don't miss out on that. The um, details for that are also available on uh, Centrist Online online um, there should be um, a page called like personal statement and um, support on your homepage that you can um, find out more about that through there um, and finally we're going to um, send you a uh, follow-up email with um, just kind of a short survey we'd really love to hear your feedback on this session and suggestions for future ones um, and that's also where we'll um, tell you how we're going to um, if yeah if there, we can find a way to answer any of those unanswered questions um, but for now I think that's all from me I won't take up any more of your afternoon um, thank you all again so much for joining and I hope to see you on Centrist online again soon thanks everyone great thank you bye Bye.